Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I'm a mechanical engineer, so um, it's a bit challenging, so I'll duck any, any complicated um, electrical questions. Um, just a little bit on our company, um, Veribox CVT Technologies. I'm the managing director and um, our business model is to come up with um, high efficiency, continuously variable transmissions, patent them, prove them by concepts and then license the, the technology. So a big deal or a big part of our company is to, uh, the process we go through is to identify some concept that might work, then you go, the next step is to do the patent searches, uh, we'll do that all in-house, and then you design around existing technology to make sure that your product is, um, is new and patentable, and then we typically file patents in 13 international countries. Yes, the contents of uh, my presentation today is I'm going to look briefly at automotive transmissions. Why that is important is um, a lot of the technology that's been developed over many years is now going from your pure internal combustion engines, uh, vehicles, to electric vehicles. Um, so we look at that. Then we look at why do we even want to bother with a CVT um, in an electric vehicle. Then I'll look at some current trends in um, electro vehicle transmissions and then um, multi-ratio EV transmissions uh, requirements from, from the, uh, the, the, the topics above. We'll see that there's, there's current trends that all the motor manufacturers are chasing. And then um, I'll look at uh, specifically at a CVT as an as a EV transmission, and then I'll present our um, radial CVT that we've developed, and um, the rest of the presentation will then focus on that. A very important slide that I added is number 11, traction drive technology. I don't know how many people are very familiar with that, but there's some real potential in, in that. And then I'll conclude my, my presentation. So first of all, if we start off, everybody knows that the manual transmission has been around for many years. It's got two, uh, actually one very uh, uh, prominent advantage. It's got a very, very high mechanical efficiency. And um, it's the most efficient of, of all transmissions simply because there's no control. So, um, where's that laser pointer here? Yeah, there's no control. And if we compare that, we'll see that the fuel consumption here and emissions is directly related to how the driver drives the vehicle. And these two are quite important things because the trend is to convert your uh, your transmission to an automatic one and then take most of the decisions away from the driver so that you can have a decent fuel consumption uh, that the driver cannot mess up too much. Okay, then these transmissions are cost effective. Um, they still the largest uh, volume, make still makes up the largest volumes of transmissions being uh, manufactured and the simple reason for that is they're very simple or not complex and they're actually cheap as well and then they require maximum um, driver uh, input. So the next step, I don't know if people can remember, the BMW SMG was very popular at some stage a few years back. All they did was took the manual transmission and they added in this case a hydraulic control system to shift the gears for you and to actuate the clutch. So ratio and clutch control was added to a manual transmission. You still have very high mechanical efficiency, but now you need to deduct the energy required to do the ratio shifting and the, and the clutch control. A very nasty problem of all these type of uh, automated manual transmissions is um, they battle with hill holding because what you end up doing, the, the driver doesn't notice well, doesn't know it's automated manually, just thinks of it as automatic. And these cars had lots of problems on uphills because what the computer will do is it will ride it on the clutch. And um, clutch problems is one of them. The automated transmissions, automated manual transmissions are, um, volumes are going down, so there's other automated transmissions taking their place. Um, this is the cheapest form of what they call two pedal transmissions or what we traditionally call automated um, uh, transmissions. Uh, low complexity, it's basically a manual transmission with a, with a servo control on it. A low shift quality, and that is a very important point going forward. All these, a manual transmission and an automated transmission, there's a certain time duration when there's zero uh, power uh, transfer. So there's a power interruption when you shift the gears. 
So with the, the, the modern standard, is you cannot have that, and I'll elaborate a little bit on that later. So the shifting quality is very bad, because um, you shift from one gear to another, there's a complete power and torque interruption, so the driver can very distinctly feel it, especially if you have five or six ratios and not ten and so on. Um, the fuel consumption is less um, driver dependent because a computer operates the clutch and the, the ratios for you. Okay, the next transmission is uh, what they call the dual clutch transmission. This has been very popular with um, Volkswagen and Audi, they're pioneering it. Um, what this basically is, is you take two manual transmissions and you put it into one. So you have two clutches and two separate gearboxes. The one gearbox takes care of ratios, say, 1, 3, and 5, and the other one of 2, 4, and 6. And with that, you have the advantage that, say, the first uh, gearbox is in the first ratio, then a or in, in a third ratio, then a computer will figure out if the se second one needs to be in 2 or 4, and it can pre-select that ratio. And when you need the ratio change, the only thing that happens is you disengage the one clutch and you engage the other one. So for shifting quality that is excellent because those clutches can overlap, the one releases, the one engages and you can maintain um, a power transfer, actually 100% power transfer. The losses associated with this obviously is the losses when those clutches overlap and slip uh, to go from one ratio to the other. So again, it's typically got manual transmission type of efficiency gear wise, but you now have two clutches uh, and the ratio control to, to uh, take care of. But very importantly, you don't have no, you don't have any power interruption with this type of gearbox. Uh, this is typically the seven speed from ZF, you get them now up to, up to nine speeds. But as you can see, as I move on with this, the complexity keeps on, on increasing. Fuel consumption is also less driver dependent and these transmissions typically have what they call econo mode. So the econo mode basically just um, cuts engine power and acceleration and you have a very, very low powered uh, version of your car and it saves fuel. Okay, now we get to the, to the really expensive uh, gearboxes. This is um, what they call automatic uh, transmissions traditionally, or AT. Um, this is where you typically have planetary gear sets. You have a torque converter, and they now have a, a lockup on that torque converter. And these gearboxes now go up to 10 speeds. So you have 10 speeds um, with lots of complexity. You have a very sophisticated hydraulic control system. Um, these gearboxes have uh, low mechanical efficiency, but they are super smooth, because you have 10 ratios. You hardly notice it when it, when it shifts and um, also the clutches overlap to give you uh, no power interruption at all. Now, I don't know if you can remember when these automatic uh, transmissions started off in the 1960s, you had uh, uh, the two-speed power glide, and then you had your turbo 400 three-speeds and four-speeds, well, we're now at, at 10. So, um, and the very important point to notice here is that you actually, what I will show later is, to optimize your power source, being an engine or electric motor, you actually need infinite an amount of gears. So your traditional gearboxes keep on adding ratios to approach a gearbox with infinite number of um, ratios. Then um, in the 1980s, about um, Bosch made a breakthrough and they started developing this CVT gearbox. And um, what this basically is, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the old scooters and stuff where they have a fan belt, and you have one pulley that opens up and the chain or the belt in those days goes to a smaller radius, on the other pulley it goes to a bigger radius, and if you then close that pulley, like on the side here, it goes to a higher radius, and uh, the, on the other one it goes to a smaller radius. So you get an infinite uh, smooth ratio variation, basically with infinite ratios between those positions. So in the old days, Dove started with this, uh, they had a rubber belt in there, the efficiency was horrible, but you had a, a CVT, in other words, a continuously variable transmission. So as I mentioned in the 1980s, Bosch was the first to, to put into production uh, this type of belt, and um, it's quite sophisticated. You have these uh, steel bands, they call, 0.1 millimeters thick, and then you have these steel elements around them, and that's how you make up such a belt. And then drive is steel on on steel in a special uh, oil which they call traction fluid and I'll 
uh, get a bit into detail later on about traction fluid. So currently on the market we have the two types. Bosch produces this belt. They've got 80% of the market. So all the manufacturers who use it use their belt and then they build their own gearbox around it. Bosch has got 80% of the market. Then the other one, the most uh, uh, prominent example it was the Audi Multitronic. Now it's also in the Subaru Linitronic. This chain is uh, manufactured by LUK and they've got the, the rest of the market. So in terms of CVTs, only two OEMs that produce the, the belt and the, and the chain. Now if we look at those things, the biggest disadvantage of any CVT is simply it's a friction drive. So with friction drives, your mechanical efficiency is lower than any gear drive by quite a bit. So I'll show later on at what levels uh, the, the mechanical efficiency is, but that's the biggest disadvantage. These are also expensive transmissions because the contact pressure, pressures uh, on steel on steel is very high, so you need to use special steel. And then um, also it needs a very complex hydraulic control system that sits there underneath. What they actually do is to control this thing perfectly, they pulse it and then they me measure the slip and you need a specific amount of slip to get the best uh, mechanical efficiency. Advantage is it's perfect, uh, perfect continuous uh, uh, shifting, so there's no power inter interruption. And I don't know if some of you have, have looked, uh, have driven these cars, and if you go on an uphill, the speed stays the same, but the engine RPM starts varying if you hit an uphill. So the engine goes to a higher power um, area, and uh, the CVT just adjusts the ratio, and you maintain your speed. And also, obviously, these things have got all kinds of uh, modes you can drive them, drive them in. Now another type of CVT that was on the market briefly was a Nissan x -Troid. That is basically two what they call toroidal shapes and you have this rollers in between. And you can see there that roller is now on a large radius there and if, and if you swivel that radius you can go to a low, lower point there and higher up there. Um, these uh, gearboxes in terms of contact stresses are even worse than the other CVTs because there's only one point contact. So in these cases, they had two sets of these things, so there's, um, and, well, a couple of in parallel, but still con uh, contact stresses, and they go up to 4.5 gigapascal, which is very high, and you need very specialized um, material for that. So this one sh uh, shares the same benefits and disadvantages as the, as the belt CVTs, but in this case, um, they battled to, to get high mechanical efficiencies, which I'll show, uh, show just now. It was quite uh, bad and uh, worse than the belt CVTs. So Nissan had that in production, and the other disadvantage of this system is that your ratio range is not very, very wide. So they're not in production anymore. There's a couple of people still doing research on it and trying to, to get past the disadvantages, but they're not in production anymore. Now those are just um, the mainstream gearboxes uh, that's been in production or still currently in production and um, there are lots of development, other development going on I don't want to get into. But the bottom line if we get to, to CVT is what you see there in the graph is typically an a engine fuel map or they call it the brake specific um, uh, a map and uh, the colors there usually represent grams per, per kilowatt hour fuel wise. So you might recognize that because the electric motor is very similar to that just with much higher efficiencies. But if you, if you have such a map, uh, an engine with such a map, and you're driving it, then if you want to operate that engine at its optimum point, you get a line like that, the white line. So what you want to do with the CVT is just get all your driving conditions, or at all conditions, keep the engine at that, on that white line, and you have the optimum efficiency for your engine. So you can see the red dots there are typically what happen with dual clutch and automatics, Every time they shift ratios, they away from the line and you lose efficiency. So that is the, the basis why CVTs entered the, the automotive market. And what, what I'll show a little bit later is if you start regenerating, then um, it changes altogether. So here are just the graph to show you what, what actually happens. If you're accelerating the, the graph there, every time you see a spike there, it's a gear change. And very importantly, every time a step, a gearbox, which is automatic or dual clutches, does a shift. You lose energy because there's clutch slipping involved and you also get an emission spike. So those are the two things. And the emission spike nowadays are more important than uh, any uh, fuel consumption because uh, emissions, you pay a, a penalty if you don't meet them, but fuel consumption not. 
Okay, so um, what does a CVT do? You, you get power source optimi optimization, and you also get uh, regenerative braking optimization, which I'll show in a, in a slide just later. Now, looking at this whole package, uh, there's a thumb suck rule if you take a step transmission, more specifically a five speed, and you compare it to a CVT, and you say, okay, let's just assume that the CVT and the manual transmission have got equal efficiency. That effect will give you a 30% better fuel consumption. But now the CVT is not, the mechanical efficiency is not that, that high, so you don't get that full benefit. But about two or three years ago, the CVT fuel consumption in a city cycle was better than any other transmission, including the manual transmission. So that's when the volume started really picking up. And also the other advantage of a CVT is if you have hybrid vehicles, um, it, it integrates very nicely. So if we just look at, let's see if this one, yeah. If we look at the current trends currently in um, electric vehicle transmissions, um, what, I've, what I've shown there is a picture of a typical uh, efficiency of a motor and inverter, electric motor and inverter. So you can see it, it looks very much the same as the, the fuel map for an um, for internal combustion engine. And you can see the areas you want to avoid is pull away, where the motor speed is zero, that's your bad area, areas. And also when the car is at its maximum speed, when the, engine, uh, when the motor is turning at, at full speed. So in this case, we can see 92.5% up to a 75% year. So there's quite a bit of, of optimization there. But that, this is not the map for regeneration. I'll show that later. So the rationale behind the current uh, development is that um, a fixed ratio cannot optimize the motor and it cannot optimize the re regeneration optimally. So currently in development, they've put stepped ratios up to, to four into uh, development. That's not yet into production. And um, I'm just going to pick up two examples here. Uh, GKN is a gearbox development company. They have introduced a two-speed, what they call e-axle, and that's in production in the BMW i8. So just by changing from a, a fixed speed ratio to a two-speed, they were able to take a 100 kilowatt motor, substitute it with an 80 kilowatt motor, which is 20% lighter, uh, to 20% smaller, 28% lighter, and acceleration improved 0 to 50, 0 to 100 as well. And um, the way they do it was uh, using synchronized shifting. Now, now they, they're the only people currently getting away with that. So what they do is, uh, this gearbox of theirs is in the first ratio. You, you drive it, and then the computer decides it's time to go to the next ratio. It cuts the motor power, it pulls it out of gear, then it adjusts the motor speed within a fraction of a second to adapt to the new ratio, and then it engages. They're the only people currently doing that. In all other cases, people uh, put uh, a, a, a clutch in there, and or they employ more than one, one motor. So this specific one has got 100% power interruption, but currently it's in production. Now we'll see there's some other people challenging this concept. Uh, Urlikon Garzanio, they uh, company specializing in high-end gearboxes, typically for your Ferraris, Maserati, Aston Martins. And what they have done is said, <clears throat> now let's rather take a dual clutch gearbox, which is supposed to have dual clutches, but what we'll do is we'll put a motor on each gearbox. So when you shift ratios, at least one motor is still driving. So they get away with that. They got a 15% uh, improvement in vehicle efficiency, meaning energy use. And um, they've only got, at worst, a 50% power interruption. And that only occurs when uh, both motors are supposed to drive at full power. So at fractional powers, you won't even notice it. So these are the two uh, examples that's currently um, in production. Then we also see what Bosch is doing. Their uh, development is centered around changing their CVT as is now and replacing the hydraulic control system with the electric one. Simple reason for that is it doesn't make sense if your, your uh, primary power source is electric and then you have electric motor driving a hydraulic pump in order to, to, to operate your gearbox. So they're looking at an electric, pure electric control system. But yes, the same benefits um, in electric vehicles as I've pointed out um, earlier. Now here's a map showing uh, 
Um, just by the way, at the end of the presentation, there's links. We've got, done a couple of studies of these things with proper documents that you can download. But this is from one of the, one of the researchers done, and you can see here is, um, if the vehicle is accelerating, that's your optimum line, and then as the kilowatt climbs, the motor speed re remains fairly constant, and just the current goes up. But here is the interesting part. If you start braking and regenerating, you see in order to extract more kilowatt from your, um, from your regeneration, you need to push up the motor speed quite, quite a bit. So typically here, yeah, you'll find a huge advantage of a CVT um, that can actually ad uh, adjust the ratio to, to accomplish that. So if we look at requirements for... Um, for the current transmission and in electric vehicles. And um, just by the way, from all the research we've done is, it looks like there's, uh, they've reached a point of no return, so next generation electric vehicles will have more than one, one ratio. So the first thing we see there is you cannot have hydraulic control, uh, for the simple reason your primary power source is electric. Um, ratio changes must be imperceptible to the driver, in other words, no power interruption or not even any power interruption, not even a fraction of it. Um, so if you go with no power interruption at all, you will need an automated clutch and also an automated ratio control um, uh, system, or you need to have one, uh, more than one motor. And as I've mentioned, current solutions include uh, a four-speed dual clutch transmission with multiple motors. And um, currently in the industry, partial power interruption is acceptable. Um, a single motor with uh, multiple speeds results in 100% power interruption, so that will, will not stay for long. Then the other very important thing is the, the ratio range uh, of the uh, internal combustion gearboxes that I've presented earlier is about up to 10. So if you take the first ratio and you divide it by the highest ratio, you sit with a factor 10. With uh, electric vehicles, uh, the need is much, much smaller. So you with a 2.3 to about 2.5 is, is completely sufficient. And the summary here is that a CVT can fulfill all of above requirements, with the only downside currently being the lower mechanical efficiency. So the point here to see is that there is a radical change uh, uh, going through the electric vehicle research at the moment, and in some as we see the Audi R8, is that moving away from a fixed gear ratio uh, adds exponentially amount of um, complexity if you compare it to a fixed ratio. And that's why people like Tesla are still sticking to, to one ratio, but um, yeah, I don't know if they will have to change. Maybe on their more uh, uh, sedan models, they will maybe have to make a plan there. Um, okay, so a CVT as an as a EV transmission, the, the benefits of uh, or uh, what is suited and what not. First of all, current commercial CVTs are not suited. I mentioned the hydraulic control the low mechanical efficiency, and current CVTs are also very, uh, they're very heavy and they, they're expensive, the ratio, the, the reason I've ma uh, mentioned. So now I get to the point where we've designed a, a uh, CVT gearbox called the radial CVT, and um, we've managed to address all those, those issues. So the first thing that I'll show is it's got very high mechanical efficiency, there's no hydraulic control, the way you shift ratios is pulse width modulation controlled and a 90, 90 watt motor, uh, 12 volts, so uh, very little power to shift your ratios. Um, a very important thing to note is all the existing CVTs have got two uh, friction drive interfaces in series. So for the belt CVT, you have power going from the first pulley to the chain or the belt, and then from the belt to the secondary. So two friction drive interfaces in series. We just have one. Uh, it's very cost effective, simple, compact, and it's got a robust de 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 uh, design. And then obviously, it can fully optimize EVs in driving and in regeneration. <clears throat> now we see that just a few benefits before I show you what our um, actual device looks like. The benefits from going from a fixed ratio to a CVT is first of all energy saving. Uh, if you do a bit of research, you'll see people quote figures 20%, other doing simulations get up to 30%, but whichever may be the case is that um, you, you have less energy consumption 
and then you can do two things with that. You can um, extend your range or you can reduce your batteries. And currently where batteries make, about, uh, make up about 50% of the cost of the vehicle, if you have a 20% reduction in, um, in, in batteries, it means a 10% uh, reduction in the cost of the vehicle. So it's huge and it's viable. Um, as we see with the GKN uh, example, you can downsize your motor. You can go to a less torque uh, motor and that results in cost and weight. And then we also see some acceleration um, improvements. Now here's our radial um, CVT. How it works is um, engine power or electric motor power comes into that blue shaft there. In here is a, a bevel drive system, so you split up your input shaft into three radial shafts. And each radial shaft has got a free floating driver. Uh, these drivers uh, make steel on steel contact with a, a front disc and a rear disc. And then they get clamped together by these mechanical springs. So input goes in here, goes to the three shafts, goes to these drivers. The drivers make contact with the two, two discs and they get clamped together. So you end up with two outputs, the front and the rear disc, and you all combine them in a planetary system and you get your output, output there. I'll show some videos on how you get uh, those things to shift ratio. But it's obvious that if that rollers are close to the center, you have, let's call it first gear, and if they move out to the, to, 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 to the biggest radius from the center, then you have your, your highest um, ratio. So what we see is one of the huge advantages of this gearbox is you have input, it goes to the three shafts, and then each of these three shafts has got a driver making contact with uh, a front and a rear disc. So you split your input power basically into six uh, parallel power paths, and in each of those power paths you, paths, you only have one friction interface. So if you compare that with the other CVTs, you already sit with 50% of the losses because you only have one interface. And then it's combined in a planetary system and you have your, your output. So here's just a... Okay. Here's just a little um, animation of um, this, uh, this gearbox. You can see that there's your three radial shafts, they get driven. And then the way it shifts ratio is this whole radi uh, radiator structure can rotate. And you can see there's a ball screw rotating it, and you've got a ramp there. So as it rotates, it moves in an actual direction, and that forces these rollers to go to a, a different radius. And on this specific one, the planetary system is just on the side. It's not, not in, the, in the center. And if there's any questions, please um, stop me and, um, and ask. Okay, I just want to see how I get to the next. Okay. Here's just an, another video showing the, um, from the side how the ratio shifting works. You can see that um, this whole structure will move to, to the right and then the, the drivers will go and run on a, on a different uh, radius. The reason for that being the one disc is convex, as you can see here, and the other disc is concave. Now it's coming out again to its um, low ratio. Just to, to, to show you a size comparison, here is our radial CVT. We compare that to an automated manual transmission that you find in the Cherry QQ3. So it's just a direct com uh, comparison, but uh, we've got a little bit of a bigger ratio range of 4.7 versus 4.5. And if you can look there, you'll see it fits the design space. So this is just a concept design to show it fits into the existing design space for an internal combustion um, engine. Now I just want to elaborate a little bit on, 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 on traction drive. This is quite an interesting topic and um, I think it's got, still got huge potential. But um, in short, when you have a steel-on-steel -steel interface lubricated in this traction fluid, um, where the steel makes or wants to make contact, you create uh, an oil film. 
And that oil film actually solidifies for a very short uh, uh, period of time, just under high pressure from onwards from about 0.7 uh, gigapascals. Um, what you then get in that interface is typically a coefficient of friction between 0.05 to 0.12. And the amazing thing about this is in the ideal conditions you get more than 98% uh, mechanical efficiency. And ideal conditions typically, I just put a, a, a picture here of a planetary system, but um, this is a, a thing uh, that was patented by one of the bearing companies. And what you have here is you have an outer ring that um, clamps together these three uh, rollers onto the center shaft. So it's act as a planetary uh, uh, gear system, but it's got no gears and you have traction drive in the line contact between the rollers and the shaft. Very interestingly, um, this concept is used in the Vortec uh, superchargers uh, where you have a turbocharger but the one side is driven by the engine. So you need a gearbox to speed the, the turbocharger up from um, 5,000 RPM at the engine to 50,000 RPM turbine speed and they use this and it's commercially available. So the technology has been uh, available since the 1980s. I've mentioned the contact stresses. It goes at highs as 4.2 gigapascal and this traction fluid is used in all commercial CVTs. The, each one has got just its own flavor of the, of the same thing. Very importantly with traction drivers, there's a couple of things that affect the mechanical efficiency. Uh, I'm not going to get into detail, but spin is one of them. In this case, you have line contact and there's no speed differ differentiation in your, in your contact, so there's zero spin. But in all other CVTs, uh, it's not zero. In ours as well, but it's very low. And then the rolling speed in the interface affects it, and then also the bearing losses in your clamping forces. So to make a long story short, as ours was designed to address all these things to achieve a very high mechanical efficiency. So just to give a little bit of history on our radial CVT, uh, we filed a patent and uh, got the PCT search report in February 2007 and all our claims were granted. Um, then we moved on and did a MATLAB simulation on the traction drive. This doesn't include the bearing losses and other things. So the traction drive interface is between 95 to 98% efficient. Then we decided to build a prototype um, our prototype used uh, Santa Track 50 and 35A is the oil we use. Santa Track 50 has been available since um, the 1990s, so it's very well known traction fluid. And we tested our first prototype in October 2017 and in January this year at, uh, at WITS. So you can see there the test setup and there is the bits and pieces of the actual um, prototype. See here the test at WITS, we have this 30 kilowatt. Um, AC machine with a VFD so you can vary, vary the speed. There we have an input torque sensor with speed, then our gearbox, again a torque sensor and then a DC motor to apply the load with. Now we are very fortunate with our results. You can see there it, um, it peaked above 90%. That's the first very important thing for us. And then also to notice is that the, the efficiency profile over uh, the ratio is very constant. Now, if we compare that with current test that was done on commercial CVTs, there's one of the Bosch push belt um, efficiencies. So you can see it's well below 90% and it also drops down quite a bit below 85. Here's another one. This is Dana with a, with a developmental CVT and you can see it peaks quite high, but um, some of the ratios are very, very low. So the advantage of the radial CVT in terms of the flat efficiency profile is that in partial load conditions like city cycle driving and, and that, uh, you will see a huge advantage because these CVTs, uh, that efficiency is under 50% uh, rated torque, but when you get like to very partial loads like idling and that 10, 20%, the efficiency drops quite a bit. So just going forward, our development um, basically reached its end with this. We'll do some more tests and maybe tweak our uh, prototype, but we're currently looking for an industry partner to commercialize this in whichever application. So yes, that's the end of my presentation. There is my details. Um, Lacedi has got this on his, on his computer, so I don't mind if, if it gets uh, sent to everybody. 
but on our website you'll find a 100 page document detailing all the simulation, design, test, everything of the radial CVT. Then we also did a study to show the, um, the advantages of uh, um, stepped ratio or a CVT in electric vehicles. There's lots of references in there to people who did um, research in, in, in this area. Then we also have a, a MP4 video of the, the full presentation. The videos that I've just showed you is in there with other stuff. And then people interested in um, our patent, it's available on the European patent database at, um, at this link. So, yes, thank you very much for this opportunity again. And if there's any questions, uh, yeah, please just ask. The first question, I can give you an example, and it's always very, very important to, to look at the efficiency over the range, but the dual clutch, uh, if, it's, if, if it has a dry clutch, which is more efficient, is just below 95%, and then it usually drops off to about 70% at very, very low loads. So if you look at the ratio range, they probably got a 3 to a 4% um, advantage, depending on, on where. And then on your second question, reliabilities of CVTs was horrible. I don't know if all of you remember the only Multitronics when they came out. Um, they actually lost the class action suit in the US because of, of that bad transmission. But nowadays, they just as um, reliable as any other thing. Bosch have got, uh, we know them quite well, Bosch have got trials in, in Europe where they sponsor taxis. And then they get like a million kilometers out of the same belt on the CVT. So, no, the, the, the reliability is there, and also the, the electronics improved quite a bit, so uh, a computer protects the gearbox, so you can't mess it, mess it up, yeah. And um, just to give you an indication of the popularity of CVTs, about every three years now, their volumes double. So, um, and in the US last year, one out of three automatics was a, a CVT. Yeah. Now, the problem I can just add here is nowadays people don't know what they're driving. They buy a car and it's automatic, so you don't know what's underneath. But um, it's quite interesting if you start looking. <laughs>